Good day, grade 10s. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. In this lesson, we're going to carry on with vector and scalars, but we don't have a lot of that. And then we're going to move on to frames of reference and motion in 1D. Okay, so we already spoken about this a little bit that we can work out the mathematical calculation using of finding the length of a side by Pythagoras and finding the length of a side using Sokotoa. So what I want to do is I just want to do a run through a quick um, revision of this because it is a long time since I've seen you and go through the motions and explain to you how to do it. Um, and then we can we can look at um, moving on to motion in 1D. Okay, so we're just going to do it theoretically just so that you've got it. Um, remember that these videos are downloadable, I mean not downloadable, viewable, so that if you um, don't understand something or you missed it or you want to have a look at it again, you're welcome to do so. You just need to come, come to the video in exactly the same way as you did originally and you, you get to watch it again and you get to slow it down, pause it, stop and watch the bits that you need to understand. So when you're doing Pythagoras, you obviously need a right angle triangle. So in this case, I'm going to draw um, our vector. And what's going to happen is, what usually happens is, they'll say, for example, that a person walked, say, four kilometers west, actually that's east, and then let's say they walked six kilometers north. Okay, and they want to know what is the resultant displacement of this person. Okay, so first of all, what we're going to do is obviously we would have to work out the resultant as in the magnitude. So what we would do is we would use Pythagoras because this is a right angle because if you travel east and then north, those are at right angles to each other so we can use Pythagoras. Now Pythagoras says that if this is x and this is y, then x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared, where r is the hypotenuse, which is the line opposite the 90 degree angle. So therefore we can say that r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. So in this case, you know what, I'm actually going to make my life a little bit easier for myself and make that a five kilometers. There is a reason. Okay, you'll see it in a minute. Um, so let's make that five. So that's going to be the square root of 4 squared plus 5 squared, which is the square root of 4 squared is 16 plus 25, which becomes the square root of what? 5 and 6 is 11, carry 1, and 1 and, oh, it's actually 3, 4, and 5, so it's not going to work anyway, it doesn't make a difference. So 1 and 2 is 3, and 1 is Four. So that's square root 41. Now in science, we don't leave our answers as square root 41. So we're going to get out our calculators and we're going to pop in the square root of 41. Um, and you are going to get 6.40. So this is equal to 6,40 kilometers. So therefore, this is 6,40 kilometers. But now, in order for me to actually know what this displacement is, this is just the size, it's the magnitude. If I want to say, um, let's say I went on a hike and I fell and broke my leg, okay? So here is my leg, it's broken. I know it's also got longer, okay? <laughs> and here is the start of the hike, the starting hat. And I can tell that I'm 6.4 kilometers away from the start. Now, if I use my cell phone and I say to the guys, listen, guys, I went on this hike. There's no real path, but I'm definitely 6.4 kilometers away from the start. They're going to tell me in which direction. They're going to ask me in which direction because otherwise they are going to be looking around all the way around in a big circle, off the screen big circle, are with a radius of 6.4 kilometers. And let me just explain what that is to you. The area of that, the area of that circle is going to be pi r squared, which is going to be pi times by 6.4 squared. Um, so let me just tell you what that is, times pi. Um, I'm just doing this quickly on my calculator. 
uh, is approximately, whoopsie, it's approximately 132 square kilometers. That is quite far, okay? Whereas if I can say, well, I'm on a bearing of this many degrees from north, then do you agree that that makes life a lot easier and the helicopter will be able to fly straight to you and be able to save you and your leg and you won't die of malnutrition and pain and gang uh, all sorts of bad things okay so that is what the situation is okay so now let us work out the bearing let's work out this angle here now there are a couple ways we can do this we are working in the right angle triangle we can either work on this little angle here x this little x here and we can say well in that case if we work out that angle then we can get this one by going 90 minus or we can work out this little angle here, Z, because they're alternate. But I think let's just work with this little angle here, and instead of X, we'll call it theta. Okay, so if we do that, we've got this right angle triangle, and I'm always a bit scared to use what I've worked out, unless I really have to, in case I've messed up. Okay, so what I'd rather do is work out you work out the angle using what they gave me in case I mess it up. So, Sakatoa, Sakatoa stands for sine is theta is opposite over hypotenuse. Cos theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. And tan theta is opposite over adjacent. Okay, so now we've got sine theta is opposite of hypotenuse, cos theta is adjacent to hypotenuse, and tan theta is opposite over adjacent. And we want this angle here, theta, but we've been given the opposite side, so we can take tick, tick, and we've been given the adjacent side, tick, tick, so we're looking at tan. So tan of theta is equal to the opposite side, which is 5 over 4. So do you agree theta is going to be second function 5 over 4? Okay, and now I need to get my calculator out. Um, sorry, for some reason, I, when I bought this, it came zipped. And, uh, whoopsie, it came zipped and it just won't stay under I don't know why <laughs> so, so that is why I have to extract it every time I want to use it it's very frustrating okay and we'll just auto hide the taskbar and everybody can see I'm using Windows 8 because of the irritating little things on the side okay now what are we doing we are using shift tan of 5 over 4 so we're gonna go shift tan of a fraction 5 over 4 and close bracket equals and it's 51.34 degrees so now this angle here this one there is 51 point 51 point now I've gone back 0.34 degrees so this angle here is 51 comma 34 degrees okay but we wanted the bearing because the bearing is always from north okay so therefore we're going to go that theta is equal to 90 well actually not theta we're going to go the bearing is equal to 90 degrees minus theta which equals 90 minus 51 comma 34 degrees, which equals what? So let's go find out. So we're going to go 90 minus 51.34 equals, and then press the ST button, 38.66 degrees. So it's 38 comma 66 degrees. So then I could say to the helicopter guys or whoever's coming to fetch you or whatever mountain and sea rescue, whatever, I could say, okay, I'm 6.4 kilometers from the start of the hut on a bearing of 38 comma 66 degrees. Okay, comma 66 degrees, come and save me. Come and save me. And then they can.
Okay, wouldn't that be cool? Okay, so that is the mathematical calculation method of calculating the resultant of a vector. And we are going to be using this um, later on when we talk more about the different parts of your vectors and that. But right now we're moving on to motion in one dimension. Okay, but in order to understand motion, we need to talk about frames of reference. Okay. So what you need to understand is that observations, we're talking about motion now, so we're talking about motion and frames of reference, okay? So observations and measurements can only be made from a certain point, okay? Now, often when you're having an argument with someone, whether you're talking about science or not, they always say it's your point of view, okay? And that actually comes from science, where they're saying that if you look at something from a certain point, then you are actually making an observation, okay? So if you're standing on the top of the mountain looking down at something, the thing might look very small, okay? But that's from your point of view. Or if you are standing right in the middle of the town, the buildings might look very big because that's your point of view, okay? So the frame of reference is often the starting point or the point of origin of motion. So when we say, oh, John um, traveled six kilometers um, for five minutes, okay? We are talking about, we are taking it that our, where we are, is the point of zero. So we are looking at his motion with respect to us, and therefore the frame of reference, what we are referring to is the starting point. The starting point is the frame of reference, okay? The motion of the object is always expressed relative to something else. So it's either the surface or another object, and this is again called the frame of reference. An example, if you are sitting in the seat of a sports car, you are stationary relative to the car, okay? You are sitting in the car, and with respect to the car, you are stationary, you are, you are not moving, okay? I'm not talking about if you're squirming in your seat and you're moving forward and backwards and you're being irritating to your mother or whoever's driving, okay? I'm talking about the fact that once you're in the car, when you're driving, okay, you're sitting in the driver's seat, and even though your feet are moving the pedals and your arms are moving the steering wheel and twiddling with the radio buttons and whatever else, okay, the the point is that with respect to the sports car, you are stationary. You and the sports car are moving together. However, with respect to the road, you are traveling at 100 k's an hour, for example. Okay, so everything is relative to something else, okay? So let us look at these two scenes, okay? You've got car B, car A is in front of you and you are in car B. Now have a look at this and just watch carefully. So while we are watching this, do you see that as far as we're concerned, the distance between car A and car B is increasing? Okay. But now, do you realize that there is no way of us, of us to tell whether car A, let me just replay it. Okay, let me replay it. With the car A has moved away from us or whether we've reversed. Okay, we can't tell if car A has gone forward or if in fact we've gone backwards. Okay, there's no way. Right, so what we need is a frame of reference. We need a frame of reference, like a tree, for example. So now let's look at the scene. Here is the tree over here, and here's a tree here, and this is car A, and we're in car B. Now let's have a look. Okay, now what is happening? Okay, it is pretty obvious now because of this tree what is happening, okay? So do you agree that the car A is still getting the same size different from us than it was before, okay? But now do you see that, yeah, you can see from the shadow of the tree that car A has actually moved forward. Okay, let's have a look at it again, okay? In scene one, yeah, is the shadow. And you can see the car, forget about scene two, ignore it. Yeah, you can see that, yeah, the car A is moved in front of the shadow, okay? So it is obvious that car A has moved away from us. We've stationary and car A has moved away. Now, if we watch it again, okay, watch scene two over here. 
Now you can see that the car A is obviously stationary. The tree and the shadow remain constant with the car, but it's getting smaller, which means that we are reversing. So it's pretty obvious that yeah, we have reversed, whereas yeah, car A has moved away from us. Okay, so that is pretty obvious, right, happy. Right, so everything is with respect to frames of um, frames of reference, okay? Now, we're going to talk about motion in 1D and we're going to do the basics of motion in 1D first and then we'll go back to applying frames of reference, okay? For, so at the moment, as far as we're concerned, our frames of reference are that it is zero with respect to us, okay? So now we're going to look at calculating distance and displacement. Now we've already done a bit of this, already done a bit of this when we did vectors and scalars, but now we're doing it specifically with respect, with respect to our um, this distance and displacement. Okay, so it says John walks five kilometers east, stops to rest for a while, then walks a further seven kilometers east. He realizes that he dropped his water bottle and he retraces his steps for two kilometers and finds it. Okay. What is the distance he traveled and what is his displacement? So the first thing we need to look at is what is the distance he traveled? So what we need to do is we need to draw some diagrams. Okay. So do you agree he traveled? Oh, sorry. So first of all, when you're doing this, you're going to be using um, a ruler. Okay. Unfortunately, like I keep saying, my software doesn't have, allow that for that. Okay, so he traveled five kilometers east and you would use a ruler to draw that beautiful straight line. Stops for rest. Then he travels a further seven kilometers east. Then he realizes that he has dropped his water bottle. And what does he do? He retraces his step by going back two kilometers. Okay. And they want to know what is the distance he traveled. Now what is distance? Distance is a scalar and the scalar has only magnitude. They only care about how big the size of the thing is. They only care about the size of the the, the distance, okay? So therefore, we only have to, all we have to do is add up how far he walked. So he walked five kilometers, plus he walked another seven kilometers, plus he walked another two kilometers. Okay, so in other words, if, the, if John was going for a run, okay, he would tell people that he ran five plus seven plus two. He would say he walked this far, which is 14 kilometers, okay? He wouldn't say to them, oh, I only walked, okay? He would give them the total distance he traveled. Okay, so he, the total distance he traveled is 14 kilometers. End of story. No directions required because it's a scalar. Now they want to know what is his displacement. Okay, so again, agreed, he walked five kilometers east. Then he walked seven kilometers east. And then he walked two kilometers back. Okay, waist. Okay. So remember that displacement effectively is how far you are from where you started. How far you are from where you started. So that there, that black line effectively represents the displacement. Now remember the displacement is a vector. Now I know this is a really easy sum and you guys are all just shouting out the answer to me as if I'm stupid, which is fine. I'm happy with that. But I want to show you how you would show the teacher when you're writing your test or exam that you know this is a vector. And what you're going to do is choose a direction as positive. So you're going to choose either or, but I'm going to choose east as positive. Okay. Then you're going to show them that you know what a resultant vector is. You're going to say his total displacement obviously is a sum of all the vectors, right? So it's going to be equal to 5 plus 7 plus minus 2 
because it's in the opposite direction. Now, I know, I know this is a really easy example and you're thinking, but why do I need to do this? Because it's a good habit to get into now because when you do this in matric or grade 11 in matric or when you get to harder questions, it is so much easier to be able to realize that if you know the displacement is the sum of all the displacements and if you go in the opposite direction and it's a negative, you will always get it right. OK, so therefore this is going to obviously be 10 kilometers and then it's a displacement and displacement is a vector, which means it has to have direction. So therefore we have to say it's 10 kilometers east, 10 kilometers east. There we go. Next. OK, now let's talk about average speed and average velocity. And again, like I said, we've kind of covered it already. We did it very, very quickly. Now we're actually going to do some calculations. OK, so average speed equals the total distance traveled divided by the total time. OK, so it is a scalar. So the speed is distance divided by time. OK, average velocity is displacement divided by time. OK, and it, oh, sorry, that's displacement. The travel divided by total time. So that is a vector, so it has to have direction. It has to have direction. Right, so now let's have a look at this question. Now it says John walks five kilometers east, stops to race for a while, and then walks a further seven kilometers. He realizes that he drops it and retaces his two kilometers exactly the same. But this time they tell you that he walks a total of three hours. And they ask, what is his average speed and what is his average velocity? Okay, so to work out what his average speed is, we need to work out his distance and his time. But now, here's the thing, what I want you to realize is that before we were talking just kilometers and I didn't change it to meters because everything was in kilometers. But I want you to start realizing that the SI unit, the SI unit for speed is meters per second. And for velocity, it's also, it's also meters per second, but obviously um, it has a direction as well. So now what we're going to do is we're going to work out the total distance in meters and then the total time in seconds and then work out his average speed in meters per second. OK, so do you agree his total distance was just five plus seven plus two, which equaled 14 hours, I mean 14 kilometers. OK, so do you agree that his total distance is going to be 14,000 meters? Because there is 1,000 meters equals one kilometer. So therefore, it's 5 plus 7 plus 2 is going to be 14 kilometers. 14 times 1,000 is 14,000 meters, right? Now we have to work out the time. So time is three hours. But now we want to change it to seconds because the SI unit is meters per second. Um, and guys, I don't want you saying meters per second minus one. OK, a lot of you guys say meters per second to the minus one and I know why you're doing that because you're thinking meters dot seconds negative one and you want to show that you know that it's negative one but by saying that what are you actually saying you're saying because this minus one means per second so when you say meters per second to the minus one you're actually saying meters per second because you're multiplying it out so don't say that okay it's meters per second end of story meters per second it's just exactly the same thing as that because what does s minus one mean it meet meters times by one over s which is meters per second that's what that whole thing means over there so please be careful of that okay so now let's just erase some of this here Okay, so now, so now, 
Okay, so we're now changing converting from hours to minutes to seconds. So we have to time set to 60 to get to minutes. So that becomes 3 times 6 is 18. Sorry. 18, so it's 180 minutes. But now we have to time set by 60 again to get to seconds. So that's two noughts. Okay, 6 times 8 is 48, carry 4, 6 fours are, 6 ones is 6 plus 4 is 10, so it's 10,800 seconds, okay, 10,800 seconds. So now the speed therefore is going to be 14,000 divided by 10,800, 10,800, and we need a calculator. So we go, we switched on, so that's good. 14, 1, 2, 3, divided by 10,800 equals 1,296. Remember, you're always running off to two decimal places, but this 9 makes it up, so it becomes 1.3. So that's 1,3 meters per second. And do you agree again, we do not need a direction because this is speed. Okay, now let's do average velocity displacement and time. Okay, so we know what this is. Let's just go back, it's 1.3. So this average speed is 1,3 meters per second. But now let's talk about his displacement. Remember he did five, then he did seven, and then he went back to, so his total displacement was actually 10 kilometers. But remember, we're converting this to meters, that is 10,000 meters. We know from the previous example that the time was 10,800 seconds. Therefore, the velocity is going to be 10 thousand divided by 10,800, which is, let's get out a calculator, 10, 1, 2, 3, divided by 10,800 equals, which is 0, 0,925, so it becomes 0, 0,9, 3. So that's 0, 0,9, three meters per second and remember he still ends east of where he started so that is his velocity 0.93 meters per second so do you see that john when he's bragging to his friends about how far he walked is not gained on how fast he walked he's not going to be using his um, velocity and his displacement what he is going to be doing is using his speed and his distance okay now now we need to talk about conversions and we've already spoken a little bit about it. I just want to make sure that you guys do actually know this, that distance and displacement is always in meters. Time is always in seconds and therefore speed and velocity is always in meters per second. So this time we're going to carry on again doing this, but we're going to convert it. Okay, so let's have a look. It says Sarah walks two kilometers away from her home in 30 minutes. She then turns around and walks back home along the same path also in 30 minutes. And it says, what is the average speed? So step one is what information is given, okay? So you can see that she's been told, let me just get through to all the steps, okay? There we go. So you can see that she's been, we've been told that she walks two kilometers away from her home in 30 minutes in 30 minutes and then what does she do she turns around and she walks back home along the same path in another 30 minutes she's obviously decided she needs to get some exercise she's going 30 minutes that way 30 minutes this way two kilometers both ways awesome okay so the, what is the information given we've just wrote it down two kilometers 30 minutes along the same path, all in 30 minutes, got it. Now it says check units are in SI units and if not convert. So what do we need to do? We need to convert this distance. So let's just read what here. So instead of two kilometers, it's 
2,000 meters. And then obviously she goes back also 2,000 meters. And the minutes have to be changed to what? The minutes have to be changed to seconds. So therefore we can say, well, it's 30 minutes times by 60, because there's 60 seconds in a minute. So it's two noughts and three sixes are 18. So it's 1,800 seconds that way and 1,800 seconds this way. Done. Now it says calculate her distance and her displacement. Well, her distance, her distance, do you agree, is going to be 4,000 meters. Whereas a displacement is what? What is a displacement? Okay. Do you agree her displacement is zero? Because she ends up where she started. She walked two kilometers away from the home and then she walked straight back to her home. So therefore her displacement is zero. Her total time, we've worked out already both ways. What we've worked out the one way is 1800 seconds. So the total time is going to be 1800 times by two, which is 3600 seconds. Okay. So now her average speed, average speed is the total distance divided by the total time which is going to be 4,000 divided by 3,600. Okay, so then what we need is a calculator and we go 4,000 divided by, divided by 3,600 equals 1 comma 1, 1. So it's 1 comma 1 1 meters per second. And do we need a direction? No, because it's a speed. Now let's talk about her average velocity. Her average velocity is the total displacement over the total time. But what is her total displacement? Her total displacement is zero. So therefore the average velocity is zero, even though she has actually traveled and she's had speed, which was an instantaneous velocity of certain points, her average velocity is zero. Okay, now let's talk acceleration. So average acceleration is defined as a rate of change of velocity. Therefore, we can say that the change of velocity divided by the time taken is the rate, is the acceleration, okay? So let me just write that down for you. So we could say that acceleration is equal to the change in velocity over the change in time. So do you agree I could write the change in velocity as V final, the final velocity minus V initial? over the change in time, right? So I could say that A is equal to VF minus VI over delta T. And I therefore could solve for VF. I could say, well, A delta T is equal to VF minus VI. Therefore, VF is going to be VI plus A delta T. And that is your first equation of motion. That is your first equation of motion. So now you've seen how we derive it. You get given this formula on the formula sheet where VF is your final velocity, VI is your initial velocity, A is the acceleration, and delta T is your change in time. Right, so let's consider a motorcyclist accelerating from rest, okay? Here is the road and there is your motorcyclist. So since it's accelerating, it's obviously going faster and faster and faster, which means if you look at, use these time intervals, and you'll notice that these time intervals are exactly two seconds apart. So it's going, the time interval is two, four, six, right? So they've, but they've given us the velocity and they measured it and the velocity was 4, 8 and 12. So can you see the velocity is increasing even though the time is the same? 
And that's how we know it's accelerating, okay? The displacement during this time is actually increasing as well, obviously, because this gap is getting bigger. So the displacement in this case is going to be 4, and then 16, and then 36. Because we expect it, we expect the displacement to get bigger and bigger, because this motorbike is going faster and faster and faster, right? So we can see that the biker is increasing by 4 meters per second every two seconds. Do you see this? Here we go. We've got, this is for every four meters, I mean for every two seconds, his velocity is increasing by four. So two second, two second, two second, velocity four, four plus four is eight, eight plus four is twelve. So the velocity of the back is increasing by four meters per second every two seconds. So acceleration, as I've said, is change in velocity of changing time, and I've proven that to you. So we get, in this case, the change in velocity, which is 4, divided by the change in time, which is 2. So therefore, this acceleration is 2 meters per second squared. And we say this, this is written as, or said, as meters per second squared. Okay, and how did they get that? Well, velocity is meters per second, right? And then you're dividing it by time, which is seconds, which is the same as saying meters over seconds times by one over second, which is meters per second squared. Right, now let's just talk a little bit about positive and negative acceleration. Now, acceleration is a vector, right? So therefore, it has positive and negative values. And as far as we're concerned, positive values mean that is going in the positive direction and negative values mean it's going in the opposite direction because it's a vector. So positive and negative signs, as far as we're concerned, indicate direction, okay? So, examples, if I tell you you've got an acceleration of 6 meters per second squared, we think, well, the person is obviously traveling in the forward direction, and the velocity is increasing in the positive direction. In other words, they're speeding up, they're going forward, and they are speeding up at a rate of 6 meters per second squared. However, if I say the acceleration is negative 4, I think the dude's going backwards, okay? And he's going backwards, and he's accelerating backwards, in the opposite direction at four meters per second squared. Okay, at four meters per second squared. But now let's talk about deceleration. Okay, deceleration, which, and, and you have to understand this about this, it's kind of tricky because a couple of years ago, they actually decided that deceleration wasn't a word. <laughs> And we had to mark everybody that said the word deceleration wrong. And they said, no, there's only positive acceleration and negative acceleration. And that students need to be able to tell the difference between whether or not you are slowing down or speeding up or moving forward or backward. Okay. Now they said, okay, hang on. We're changing that policy and we're calling slowing down in the forward direction as deceleration. So in other words, when you're traveling forwards, and you hit the brake, then you slow down, and that is called deceleration. But here's the tricky bit. It's still got a negative value. So the velocity of the object is decreasing as the object moves forward, okay? So in other words, a cyclist, cyclist brakes and decelerates at minus three meters per second squared. That means that he is traveling in the forward direction, but he's slowing down at a rate of three meters per second squared. Okay, so that's what we mean by that. It's decreasing, the cyclic velocity is decreasing at three meters per second in the positive or forward direction. Okay, and what we will do is we will do examples of this and of other things in our next lesson, which is on Thursday. So please join me then. Have a great day.